and just have a little moment. All right, we are here um, with Della and Wendy, who are both homeschool parents. And I am so excited to have both of you on the Nature Journal show live today because I feel like homeschooling. Both homeschool parents. Oops. And I'm sorry about that. I was just <laughs> explaining why that is not good to have YouTube open at the same time. And I'm just really excited to be able to talk about this subject with some people who have actual experience because I think that a lot more people are, are trying to homeschool this year or are being forced to. And I think some people who've been homeschooling for a while are interested in, in incorporating nature journaling or nature study. So um, thanks for being on the show. And um, maybe we can start with um, some personal story about how you each got started with nature journaling. So maybe let's start with Wendy first. How did you get started with um, homeschooling? Um, I was teaching briefly and um, I was noticing that the classrooms, the structure had kind of changed since I was in school. There was a lot more focus on testing and um, like the arts and history and science were all kind of getting pushed out in favor of more math and reading. And so it's just, I had never considered homeschooling before that and I didn't have kids yet, but it started to get me considering that there's a possibility that, you know, if I taught my own kids that I could make sure that they had time for those kinds of things. Mm. So it sounds like your, your experience as a teacher made you want to, um, you, you want to have more control over like what, what, what subjects were being taught um, to your kids. Yeah. And I just, you know, I think that the teachers were working so hard um, and the kids were working so hard, but it just seemed like sometimes there was just never enough time, you know, for everything that they wanted to do. And so I felt like by homeschooling, that kind of gives you the freedom to do, you know, to structure your time in the way that you feel is most beneficial without having, you know, so many constraints um, over, you know, what your curriculum is going to be or exactly how you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And did you incorporate nature study or nature journaling from the beginning? Um, yeah. So when he was, when I have a son who's nine and when he was maybe like two or three, I found out about Charlotte Mason, which is like a homeschooling philosophy. It's, it's a, you know, woman who was an educator. And um, one of the big things is the, for elementary school is spending a lot of time outside, a lot of time doing nature study, um, incorporating nature journaling. And I had never done any of that stuff. Um, I, I mean, I liked the outdoors, but I didn't, I didn't hike. I didn't, you know, nature journal, nothing. But um, there was a section of a book that was talking about how a mother can never know too much about nature. Um, and so I was like, okay, I better start figuring this out so that when he's older, I'll know what's going on. Um, so I went to like a little naturalist store and I bought little pamphlets for like identifying, you know, our flowers or birds or something. I had no idea what I was doing. And I started when he was maybe like three, I started taking him on these like little nature walks at like our local nature parks. And, um, just trying to like figure out like what is all this stuff and you know but I wanted to prioritize time in nature so it started with like 15 minutes because he didn't really want to go <laughs> I know um sorry I know I just dropped my headphone I know that a lot of kids love it but my son is like he was more of a homebody he'd rather stay like you know cuddled up in bed reading um so at first he wasn't into it, so I had to make it short and um, built up, you know, to hours eventually. And he loved it. So, um, but what I didn't expect is that I would fall in love with it. Yes. So I actually, it's been like such an amazing thing in my life um, that I really wouldn't have gotten into if it hadn't been for homeschooling, if it hadn't been something that I was trying to provide for my son just because I thought it would be good for him. But, you know, I didn't know that it would be so important to me. Wow, that's really cool. 
Um, how about you, Della? How did you get started? What's your story behind getting started with homeschooling? Well, I, we were lucky enough to have known that homeschooling was an option from the beginning because mm -hmm. we had other friends way before we had children ourselves that were homeschooling. So I had already known that it was a possibility. And when it came time to send my um, oldest, who is now 15, to school, I realized that I wanted to be the person that got to spend all the day with him. And I wanted to be the person that got to see him read. And so we ended up keeping him home to school. And it's worked out really great for us. Um, we're kind of the opposite. We are a very outdoorsy family. Both of my, myself and my husband are both marine biologists. Oh. And so we were outside a lot, but we didn't do the artistic value the um in our nature study until later so it was similar to wendy's i came across charlotte mason charlotte mason um pedagogy has a lot of it, it encompasses a lot of different tools but one of those is nature study and being outside with children and illustration and i just felt like that those we're just an, a beautiful way to experience science for young children in the natural world. I mean, we did other sciences too, but um, nature journaling was a really nice combination of all of those um, science and art. And yeah, so we would pack a backpack full of snacks and a couple, one of those little portable watercolor sets and some color pencils and take a hike and go see what we could see. Now it's part of our, we don't always go so far, but it's part of a regular routine for us. Cool. Um, yeah. Just so people know, what ages are, are each of your, your kids and how many do you have? Are you each have um, one kid or? I have two. Uh, okay. one, my oldest is 15 and my youngest daughter is um, nine. Okay. What about you, Wendy? How, what are what what um, age is your son? I have a son who's nine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. That's such a fun. I I for me like the nine, uh, the nine year old age. I know like my favorite uh, genres. There's like the books that are like nine and up. There's like that's like an actual like it's weird on the books that the, it, it says that nine and up, but. Um, okay, cool. Well, this is um, it's really fun to hear like the different stories and how different people got into it. Um, and I think the next thing that I'm um, curious about is, um, and maybe going back to Wendy to start with, is um, what ha what are some of the like most common misconceptions that you think people have about homeschooling or people who haven't done it yet? Um, what do you think are some um, things that those people uh, assume or misconceptions they have that would be useful um, to learn about? Um, I think a lot of people, you know, coming from a public school or even private school background feel like if they homeschooled, it would need to be similar to um, what it is in school. So you would spend, you know, six hours a day from, you know, preschool on um, sitting down and doing, you know, like workbooks and tests and things like that, and that it really takes the same amount of time and that it, you know, should be structured the same way for it to be successful um, to make sure that you're, sorry, <laughs> to make sure that you're hitting all the bases and you're covering, you know, what you need to cover. Um, and I think that, you know, the beauty of homeschool is the freedom to be able to make the choices for, you know, when you're going to incorporate certain subjects and um, what your timing is and I do feel like it takes a lot less time because you know it's it's just you and your children for most homeschoolers so you don't have the classroom dynamics you don't have the transitions in the same way um, and you also can integrate it into your life so you could be doing things you know talking about things reading things during breakfast or you know I know people listen to audiobooks in the car um, you know, you can make it a part of your lifestyle that doesn't have to necessarily look like what a classroom would look like. Um, but 
at the same time, you can make it really similar to a classroom, like if that's, you know, what's a good fit for you and your kids. So being able to make those decisions and knowing that you have time, I feel like time is like the greatest gift of homeschooling for both the parents and the kids because, Mm -hmm. you know, we have time to hike, we have time, um, you know, to really take our time with things Mm -hmm. and um, you don't have to stay on the same pace as, you know, 30 other students. So you can really work with where your students are at and what their specific needs are. You can kind of cater to that in a way that's, you know, not really possible um, in a larger classroom. Absolutely. Yeah, those are those are really interesting points. Um, I think that's a misconception that I had is just imagining um, translating the, you know, public or private school system to like the home and like, okay, we're going to sit down now for uh, five or six hours or whatever. Right. Uh, thanks for clearing that one up. Um, how about you, Della? What do you think is, is um, you know, like a misconception that you run into um, that people have about homeschooling? Well, I think that one of the largest misconceptions is that homeschoolers are isolated mm. or socially awkward, <laughs> mm. that they don't get socialization skills. And um, that's one of the hugest misconceptions because under different circumstances than our current ones, Um, Homeschoolers are usually very active and there's a huge array of activities for them, including nature journaling. Like there are groups that form based on various interests and then these groups will go and do things together um, in different ways. And there are co-ops and field trips and just all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of homeschooling communities have some sort of park day on a regular basis every week, every month, and then um, other activities in addition to that. In our area, there's, it's, it's the opposite. 20 years ago, it would be difficult for people to find things to do or resources or friends or groups. And now you really have to pick and choose which ones you do so that you can make sure you get your academics done. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise you would be gone out of the house all the time. So oh. that's when COVID is not not happening. But that's the biggest um, worry that I see new homeschoolers come into because there's this misconception that homeschoolers are socially iso- that are isolated and they're socially awkward, and mm. it's it's not the case at all. That's so interesting. Um, Maybe um, while you're answering that, maybe you could describe a little bit. I know right now people don't have access to these, but um, could you describe a little bit more like some of these groups, like you said, that um, you're involved or you have been involved in nature journaling specific ones even for homeschool families? Well, there's um, a couple. I mean, there's a couple different categories, genres of that kind of thing. There's a whole... I don't know if I would call it movement. Maybe you have a good word for it, Wendy, but there's a whole group of people that use the hashtag wild and free. And yeah. they, yeah, they form groups in different areas across the country. And the commonality in that group is nature. And so they will organize hikes or events um, to go out in groups in, a, um, in the area. In our area, we've had groups that have uh, like just individual groups where people would get together and go on a walk and and this particular one that I'm thinking of had an artist as um, the facilitator and so when they would go on the walk she would facilitate or instruct coach on their um, their artwork or what they saw so it sounds like um, maybe that is like a misconception that people have as well as this idea that the parent has to do like everything. Oh uh, yeah, that's a big one. Okay, cool. Well, the wild and free, I've heard of that one before. Um, I interviewed and spoke with um, Amaya on here um, some weeks ago and she's a homeschool teen and she her um, family is part of that. And so I was looking it up a little bit. Um, so that sounds really cool. Um, what about you, Wendy? Going back to this whole thing about um, 
a time. Um, someone in the comments on YouTube is asking, you know, like what is a typical day kind of look like and are there certain routines that you do? So I feel like that question relates to um, your response about this misconception that there's um, that you have to have the same kind of time chunk like um, normal school does. So could you describe kind of like what your day might look like or how that is different or similar to um, other schools? Yeah, um, I think it has, you know, changed over time as my son has gotten older, you know, we spend more time on academics. Um, but as it is, I've really tried to pay attention to what our natural rhythm is for our days, like what works for us as far as you know, some people, when they wake up, they want to get started like right away. And some people, you know, need some more time to ease into the day. And so um, for us, we're kind of in between. We do start school right after breakfast, but we don't necessarily eat breakfast at like, you know, 6 or 7 a.m. It might be like 8. Um, so we do have... Um, I have like our lessons planned out, so I already know what we're going to be doing, and you know my son already has an idea of what we're going to be doing. So we do um, most of the academic subjects almost every school day, and we tend to school four days a week with our academic subjects, but we do like all of them, and then the fifth day we do um, with besides COVID, we have two nature groups that we go to. Um, but those days we are our science days. Um, we do science throughout the week, but we incorporate it on those fifth days. And um, so it would be like have breakfast, do math, um, because I find that if we don't start early for our family rhythm, we get too distracted or, you know, he starts working on his own projects um, and it kind of feels like we have to pull away from those things to start our day. So we like to get it done early. So, you know, we'll do math and science and language arts, um, you know, and then we alternate like history days. But we do all of that at home usually. And um, it only takes maybe, depending on the day, maybe like two and a half hours um, and it was less when he was younger. And then after that, um, he has projects he wants to work on. So like he's writing stories and he wants to like type up his stories. So even though that's not part of our formal school work, to me, that's still language arts. So it's like our school day is over. Um, you know, we do our chores. We try to finish by lunch and then we do chores and then there's free time for projects. So he will work on things that are academic, like he'll hang out reading in bed, you know, reading history books, you know, or he'll be typing a story or um, we do a lot of PE because he's nine and he's very active. He's very into sports. So sometimes we'll go to a park and I'll bring our schoolwork and we'll play baseball for like an hour and a half and then we'll do math. Um, so, you know, it's kind of flexible, but we follow the same general rhythm of the day as far as when we're getting our schoolwork done. Got it. Yeah, well, that's really cool. Well, it sounds like, Wendy, um, you mentioned, you know, projects being really central to the way that you um, homeschool. So I'm curious, and um, maybe I'll pose this question for either of you, but how do you, um, like with nature journaling or nature study, like what kind of project-based learning um, goes well or has gone well for you with um, nature journaling or nature study? It's like, it seems like project-based learning um, that you're talking about, like writing stories and stuff for language arts. What are some that you found uh, work well or maybe things that could be ideas for other parents, either for either of you, that question? Um, I'll start. <laughs> um, okay. I do think that tracking things over time, uh, there's so many things that you can track in nature over time. So having various projects going on throughout either, you know, a term or even a whole year um, where, you know, we track the change of the leaves on, you know, the tree outside, we track the weather, we track, um, like the moon position compared to our house at certain times of night. 
Um, so being able to have like long-term projects where we're keeping track of changes, you know, throughout the year, mm -hmm. I feel like is really beneficial because then we can start to predict when things might happen based on, you know, previous years or previous observations. Mm -hmm. And so have, which of those have your, has your son been like, ha has he had, cause it sounds like with um, some of your other ones, there's almost like not a clear line between like when it's um, schoolwork and when it's his own projects, cause, which sounds really great that he's um, self-motivated on, on those. Ha have you had examples of that with sort of nature related? It sounds like, um, you know, your son is, it likes like, is, is more like literary and likes being like inside um, reading sometimes more but like have you noticed any um, nature related things where he the project was really like something that he wanted to initiate yeah um he's been really interested in weather we live in southern california and so we have most days are sunny and warm like throughout the whole year and our summer um, is a bit late, like it's more August, September, October. So yes. we've been tracking the high temperatures and okay. he gets like super excited for like days that are over 100 or uh -huh. um, days that are over 110, which we have had this year. Uh -huh. So he checks the weather like every morning, he checks it midday, he wants to like fill in the color for the temperature chart. Um, so he's like super, you know, pumped to be, he's, he's hopeful that it's going to be crazy hot. And so that like kind of motivates him to awesome. check on it and, um, you know, record that data. Mm -hmm. And then another one is that we have, um, there's an orb weaver spider outside his window that yeah. connects to, we have like white sage growing and then we have like a planter hanging. And so it builds its web between the sage and the planter and the building. Mm -hmm. And so every night it starts at eight o'clock, um, mm -hmm. it rebuilds its web. And uh -huh. so it's literally like right in front of his window. Uh -huh. So we watch that and we've journaled about that. Um, and he just kind of likes to, He's more into keeping track of like, okay, what time of day did it start? How long yeah. did it take? Did it change anything? Which days was it not even there for some reason? So he's more about like data um, and less interested in like the artistic side of journaling or nature study. Mm -hmm. um, but he does draw, you know, he does draw pictures of things. Cool, wow, that sounds really fun. I want a spider right outside my window like that. <laughs> We have one of those too, but it's a you golden do? orb weaver and it doesn't build its nest again every night, okay. but it, it is pretty cool. What projects have um, your kids um, been motivated about, Della? Well, our most constant project is um, our nature journals. So mm -hmm. the with my youngest, my oldest is in high school. Mm -hmm. And so um, it changes a little bit when they hit high school. But with my youngest, we just have nature journaling in the loop. So we usually go on a short walk. Um, she finds something that she wants to draw. We draw it. We look it up in one of our guidebooks. That's what we do on a regular basis. But we have done some unit studies or blocks that are all about um, f flora or fauna or mm -hmm. both. Um, we did a whole series of naturalist blogs and there's just so much you can do with that. So one of my favorite is the citizen scientist projects mm -hmm. that you can do. There are bird counts, uh, you can do monarch tagging. Mm -hmm. um, there's, we participated in a local one from, that was sampling wetland ponds. And wow. so we would go out and dip net and identify the tadpoles that we found mm -hmm. and log the data and sent it into the, the um, nonprofit that was running it. So that was pretty, that was fun. The other things that we have done, I love butterflies. So we raise butterflies in aquariums. Oh, nice. um, yeah, that, that one's uh, really easy and very fun. And um, it's, it just touching, like it's striking to see it in, yeah. in its physical form. And then some of the projects that have ended up being initiated with my children, like finding tadpoles out in the middle of the pond. So we set up a terrarium with a low area that had water so we could watch them um, through their metaphor, meta, 
morphic changes. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things that we've cool. done. Those sound, I, I mean, it feels like it feels like the weather um, tracking the weather project and um, these citizen science ones and these like you know watching the metamorphosis of um, tadpoles or butterflies. I mean, it's like I want to do those too. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you know, I feel like um, people who are adults and aren't homeschooling um, could use some of these yeah. projects also. Um, so that's really cool. And all of this sounds like really really great and really fun so far like you know um more more time um you know like connection to all these like real um real life like projects that are um you know motivated by the kids so um i guess what i'm wondering is um like what are some of the difficult things or what are some of the challenges and specifically like um like how can uh, i mean maybe we can talk about like um, specific ones that you've dealt with, but like, what can, how can we like, um, prepare, prepare parents who, who maybe are going to start this for the first time or want to incorporate nature journaling or nature study? What are some like challenges that, um, you, you could assume th that they will probably have to face and like, how could they, um, prepare for that? Like, what are some common, um, challenges that most parents, um, have to face and, how would you recommend someone who's new or just wants to start incorporating, maybe they've been homeschooling for a while, um, but want to incorporate nature study, like what are some challenges, starting with um, Wendy? Um, I think that my biggest challenge over time, like in the beginning, uh, was really my own expectations. Mm -hmm. I think that I was hoping, I love art, I love drawing, um, so nature, st nature journaling was a really um, exciting transition for me to try out and um, spend time on, but that's not my son's preference. And um, so I think really thinking about what is it that's actually exciting about this experience for my son and what can I do to really um, spark his interest, but also help him to, um, you know, get excited about noticing things, get excited about, you know, watching things. And when he was four and we first started, like I would go out, you know, and we had like a little, he had his own little nature journal and um, he would trace rocks. And so he would get rocks from the side of the trail and then he would literally trace around them. Um, and he was so excited about that you know and he he used to trace twigs and um it wasn't what i had in mind you know <laughs> i think that you see these beautiful things online and you think your kid's gonna love it and you're you know if you love it they will love it yeah. and it's it's not always the case and so i think really focusing on like what is actually helping him build this connection with the natural world and, you know, build a reverence for um, plants and animals and what is going to be the thing that connects for him. And it it's going to look different for different kids and it's going to look different for, you know, the parent versus the kids. Um, so I think just really being respectful of like who your kids are as people and that if they are kind of not into it that that's something that it comes over time for a lot of people um we did end up you know before covid i started a nature journaling group mm -hmm. and um so we would go on hikes and we would journal and we journaled like every time um for a while <laughs> and but right now it's on hold for covid but getting from a place where you know he was not really into hiking or you know just wanting to trace rocks or um not really seeming like it was working um yeah. i think that if i had despaired at that time you know that i might have given up and um so i think that just knowing that i've seen kids just latch onto it like immediately and right. love it and um and then there are kids where it's like Maybe it'll never be their thing, but they are still benefiting so much 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed so much that my son notices because of all the time that we've spent. And um, so sometimes it can be a slow start and sometimes it can be subtle and sometimes it can look different than, you know, you padding your mind, yeah. but it's still, it's still benefiting them in ways that you won't even know, you know, possibly for a long time. Um, but it's still worthwhile and it's still, you know, building something inside of them. Wow. That's really, I mean, that's really deep. I feel like the whole idea of like, uh, the challenge around our expectations is something that applies to just us as adults as well. So it sounds like you've mm-hmm. learned a really, um, cool lesson with your son. And it's, it, it's great that you, you noticed that. Cause I don't know if everybody, um, some people keep kind of pushing with that. They, they hold on to their expectation a little bit, uh, more <laughs> and keep pushing the kid. That's, that's a really interesting challenge. And I think that is some, that will be useful for people to, to be able to, to, um, have a kind of uh, preview of that in advance before they get started. Um, what about you, Della? What has been like a, a major challenge um, for you or, or something that you think would help other people? Well, I think going along with um, what Wendy said, I think it helps to, if you can find something that your child is interested in that they latch onto, um, it's really helpful. And maybe knowing like where to look, particularly mm-hmm. for things like insects or wildlife, that could be really helpful. Um, I'm trying, you know, under logs, under rocks, um, things like that. But the thing that, the challenges that come to my mind um, are the challenges that just every mother or parent, homeschooling parent deals with, like bring food, bring water, <laughs> bring insect repellent. Um, if you have a toddler, bring a backpack or, you know, some device that you can carry them because they're going to get tired. Those are the things that I usually, you'll last a lot longer if you can bring those things. Uh-huh. Great. Yeah. So st- having, taking care of some of the logistical stuff and making right. it covered. Great. Right. Cool. Well, I think those um, talking about those challenges is is a um, a really great segue. I think into um, maybe some like specific techniques or um, uh, ideas for um, motivation. So uh, I'm really curious. I'm always really curious about um, motivation and also this whole idea of um, this finding the balance between like pushing and uh, and pulling I guess so like Mm -hmm. instead of saying like oh like you know like at what point do you um say that that's enough like pushing of because I feel like some kids um and you mentioned um Della that um your um kid who is in high school it sounds like they are less interested in nature journaling now is that true oh well in nature journaling he's still very interested in nature but Mm -hmm. um you know, he loves photography, so he does that. That kind of takes the place. When I mention right. maybe we want to sketch this in a notebook, he's like, I, I can take a picture. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit because I'm curious, like, especially with teens, it seems like um, that the people that I, I, a lot of people that I talk to, their kids maybe go through a stage where, oh, it's really easy. Uh, it can be easier to bring in the nature journaling. Um, and in our commu- if you look at our community too, there I feel like, um, we have a lot of older folks, and then we have um, we have families with younger children who are doing nature journaling. And it seems like those are two really oh. big engines in the nature journaling community. So um, I'm curious, like, what you think about, like, um, and maybe Wendy can chime in on this as well. But like, how um, how do you feel about like like at what point do you? And and I've talked to some some kids like. Amaya was saying that she, uh, her mom was telling her like, oh, you should practice your lettering more or something like that. And um, she was resistant to it. And um, then later she finally listened to her mom and she took this lettering course. And now lettering's like doing like different kinds of uh, fanciful lettering is like one of her favorite things. And in in our conversation, she said um, she was glad that her mom had pushed her. So how do you, Della, find like the balance there um, in homeschooling of like pushing versus uh-huh. not? You know, well, like I said, he's already interested in photography uh, or not photography, but 
in nature, particularly nature photography. So on the, on his photography, I haven't had to push him at all. Right. Um, he's just self motivated on that end. But I think maybe um, groups would be helpful. You know, like um, peers around their same age doing it together. We haven't done it in a while because of COVID, but. Mm -hmm. um, we used to hire um, a guide, like someone that worked locally and knew the edible plants in the area. And then we would go, all go on a walk together and he would show us all the edible plants and we would take little nibbles and tastes. Um, so maybe something like that yeah. could help. I, we, I've also purchased books for him. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really nice book that has a five year journal kind of um, so it has some naturalist information in the beginning and it, the rest of the book is um, journaling. So mm. I've done some of that. Mm. But yeah, it because it's, it's a little tenuous when you get to high school if they don't have that foundation before because um, things have to have to happen in high school, you know, mm. um, for the future. And so we tend to focus um, it's shifted for us in focusing on academics um, mm -hmm. and then it, the leftover time is for his own interests so yeah. it does change and then we as a family make an effort to go and do hikes and explore coastlines and those kind of things mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's um, those are some really good points that I think that you brought up, especially I, I find the um, and, and when I talk to I talk to um, Dallas Noctigal, um, who has who, who does um, homeschooling and nature study. And she also has a podcast and stuff about um, art skills and teaching art in homeschool uh, in home in homeschooling. And she was talking about how um, in um, Charlotte Mason homeschooling, it, the idea of bringing in like um, a naturalist or bringing in some other teacher um, that isn't the parent can be uh, really useful and, and motivating to the kids. So it sounds like, you know, Definitely. showing them that there's other people there, whether their age or other people just besides the parent, that seems to be like um, really helpful. Um, so Wendy, have you used um, any of the, those types of motivation where um, you, um, you know, try to find like um, peers or like a community or like another um, adult besides um, that's not from your family, maybe to like to help with your son or motivate your son towards like a particular thing. Yeah. Um, so we had before COVID, we had two nature groups. Um, one of them we've been in for a few years and they are more focused on longer hikes. Mm -hmm. And so there's often less time for journaling because you know, we want to get farther, um, but they do now. And so that's been, you know, really good. And then I started a second group that I wanted to do shorter hikes or even just walks and spend more time journaling. And um, that group actually ended up being much larger than I initially planned. So um, if everyone showed up, there were like eight parents and like 30 kids wow. and, um, having that many kids together like we would all sit down and journal at the same time wow. and then we I took a lot of inspiration from Jack Laws as far as discussing and sh you know sharing our journals afterwards so um you know talking about them in a way that's not just complimenting the pretty ones you know that's yeah. more noticing like oh I like how you know you notice the different colors there and you were you know writing about that or how you showed um you know this compared to that or you know just kind of making those kinds of comments so I think I noticed on the days that we ended up not having time to share our journals that it didn't have that same impact as when we did and so I feel like that was beneficial to my son for sure because you know there were the group was all the way from toddlers to 12 year olds mm -hmm. and so you could see you know the different interests and styles and you know some kids would go in one area and some kids would go in another and 
you know, they would choose different things. So I think he was excited to share his and he was excited to see what other people were doing. And I think that, you know, one of the things that can be tough for parents and homeschooling parents, I think in particular, is sometimes your kids can get the idea that the things that you do are just like some weird thing that your family does. Uh (laughs) And they're not a part of the wider world, that it's just like mom has this like, okay, she's into nature. Um, But when you see that other kids are out there doing it, when you see that other parents are passionate about it, because the parents in my groups, both groups are really passionate um, about, you know, sharing the natural world with kids. So I think that that really rubs off. And even when there's not, you know, as much time actually journaling, just being there with the other kids, you know, in nature, makes such a positive memory of it that the journaling you know by like osmosis gets a positive you know memory to it too Mm -hmm. wow yeah that's so uh, there's something so powerful about being with a group of other people doing something and that you don't require like it's so much harder to be with like one kid and say like okay do this like just this is what we're gonna do right now and then if you're just with like or if there's a whole group of people doing it, it just like, yeah, it's, you get kind of, it's, that's real that's a really cool, um, uh, benefit of, you know, community. So, um, this is all really great stuff. So I'm wondering, you know, like for people who are, um, you know, maybe even people who aren't necessarily homeschooling, um, but that want to do like, could do like one little thing on the weekend, um, nature drilling with their kids or people who are already, um, you know, doing homeschooling, but haven't incorporated the nature journal or nature study or like, what is just like one small thing um, that people could um, start with in their, in their families? Um, Della, how about you go first? I think um, one of maybe the easiest, if you keep up with this, the simplest, have you ever seen a phenology will? Yeah. It's like a circle divided up into 12 spaces and once a month they draw a little picture of something that happened in nature during that time. Um, mm-hmm. That could be a, a very easy small step for somebody. Cool. That's a great one. How about you, Wendy? Um, I think making like a small kit of like, you know, lightweight materials and really simple um that you can bring out when you do go you know into nature go hiking um so that it's easy it's easy to access and it's not it's not everything you would want for all of art you know it's just something really simple like um so being able to know that it's already packed up that you definitely brought it and then getting it out really early on so that you don't carry it around and never use it um Because it can be so quick. You could spend five minutes, you know, or 10 minutes and still get a benefit from it. So I think the biggest thing is if you really want it to be a part of, you know, your life and your children's life, just making it into a habit, making it something normal that you do. Um, And I mentioned nature or hiking, but honestly, it can be your house it can be you know um your yard it can be your local park that's not a nature park um you know we have a park that's like you know playground kind of park but there's a lake and there are geese and you know dragonflies and it's it's a very like urban kind of park but there's so much there so it doesn't have to be some big long hike to somewhere beautiful. You know, it can be the spider outside the window. It can be, you know, it can be things like pigeons, like things that we take for granted are everywhere. Um, ants, you know, it's kind of whatever you make of it. It doesn't have to be this big, beautiful production. You know? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, what are some resources that you you two would recommend for uh, people who are getting started or want to incorporate some more? Are there, um, you know, like what books have been really useful or websites or, or some of the groups? Um, what what are some like resources people can check out? 
You go ahead, time. Wendy. Okay. Okay. Well, um, if you want to be, so definitely Jack Laws, um, John Muir Laws. He has mm -hmm. a website. He has tons of videos available for free. They are amazing. And um, he has a book, you know, the, how to, let's see, wait, I have, <laughs> I have. Um, how to teach nature journaling, that yeah. one. Yeah, it's a fabulous How to teach book. nature journaling, um, mm -hmm. hold on. Okay. So he has the um, Law's Guide to Nature Journaling. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, there's the How to Teach Nature Journaling. So mm -hmm. that would be, you know, more for like the parent um, mm -hmm. or whoever's, whoever's going to be teaching it. Um, but also like having some field guides for local um, plants and animals, I think is really helpful. When I first started, I bought a book for all of California and mm -hmm. it was really frustrating to me because I couldn't find any, like I couldn't figure out like what that flower was. I couldn't figure out, you know, what that bird was. I needed things that were much more specific to my region. And yeah. um, especially for California, there's so much variety. So I think once I started getting things that were very specialized, it really helped us. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, but I have a pamphlet that's from a local nature center and it has just yeah. all birds for that nature center. And so the difference between a guide for birds of California versus you know, right. birds at this nature center. Um, I feel like that's really helpful to kind of narrow it down more mm -hmm. um, so that you can be more successful and so that it's easier for the kids to, like I have a pamphlet for wildflowers that's mm -hmm. just uh, our county. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're found in other areas in the state, but these are the ones that you're going to be finding most often. That's really cool. Yeah, that seems super useful. How about you, Della? We use um, the John Laws books too. They, mm -hmm. they are just so incredible. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, they're written for adults, mm -hmm. but I've used them with my children also. We'll sit down and use the illustrations. And then I love um, for kids in general in nature drawing, like when we come back, if we do an illustration that we label for anatomy, um, there's a book called Nature Anatomy that I really enjoy. Yeah. And there's a series, I agree completely with Wendy on it's really important to get guides that are um, usable, <laughs> which means that they need to be local um, because it is difficult if you aren't familiar with a particular species or a group to try to figure out which one something is when you have a hundred to choose from but um there's also more generalized um the tag along guides mm -hmm. and those I, I say that you need specific nature guides but those are more general too and they're they're kind of like they're books for children so they'll they talk about whatever is in the guide and then they give a few examples so it gives you not so much like a specific tree that you were looking for but it gives you field markers to look for to identify you know like what the leaf will look like what the bark will look like or various things they they have all kinds of the little tag along guidebooks so um i think they do birds and trees and um, I had another book that I really like. We just got through doing a tree block last year. Um, was it's called the Tree Book for kids and their grown ups, and it's just a fabulous. It's just chock full of great information that is presented in a way that's easily understood, and it also has a field guide. And those they're trees throughout the world but the information in the front of the book really makes it worth mm. it cool those sound like some great resources um wendy did you find that did you want to show that pamphlet or did you yeah so i want to show you like i can't find i actually got rid of some of the pamphlets that were not working for me early on but to give you an example of what i started out with um it was 
illustrations of the plants and they're really tiny and yeah. they don't really look that different from each other right um to me and so yeah, i yeah. couldn't really tell mm -hmm. and i don't have i can't find the pamphlet that we use now for my nature group but mm -hmm. um as a as an older child or a parent resource, I have um, I have a book that's just wildflowers of our county and like our watershed. And cool. it has so much detail that it would be overwhelming for young kids. But yeah. this is one particular type of flower um, and it's showing like the varieties of the same kind. And yeah. I was able to learn so much more easily from something yeah. that I knew, like these are actually at our local parks. And um, so being able to have something specific or the, I do love to buy the guides from our local nature centers. So common birds at the El Dorado Nature Center, it has, it has like a, a lot of water areas. So there's more birds there compared to other parks. And so having like large, um, large photos and brief descriptions compared to the tiny little, um, I don't have one with, with birds, but yeah. the tiny little pamphlets. Right, right. Where there might be things that don't even exist in our area of the country. And yeah, so yeah. it's confusing for kids because there's a lot of lookalikes and so you think you found it and it's not the same thing. Yeah, cool. Um, someone's so, asking in the comments about apps too. Do you use any apps? Have you found any oh, apps? Oh, yes. Um, I love the Cornell University's Merlin app for birds. Okay. It's fabulous. Yeah. Is that you the have, free one? Is that the it free is, one? it is okay. free and they do a, a great job. They And they have a couple programs too. One of their pro they have a, a bird counting program, Simpson Scientist Project, that you can work with. Marley, can I back up just a second yeah. on resources? And this doesn't really fall into the um, same category as what we were talking about, but one of the things in homeschooling that's really important is reading aloud books together. Mm -hmm. And um, two books that we loved when we were doing our nature block were uh, What the Robin Knows. Oh, yeah. And you know that one? It's a fabulous book. It's written for an adult, so I would say they need to be at least later elementary to follow along. And then The Hidden Life of Trees was also fabulous. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I have. I, I read the um, the What the Robin Knows. It's There's not very many books that talk about um, how to interpret um, bird calls to like make predictions about like, oh, there's a predator or things like right. that. So the language aspect, um, it seems like that's like the main book about that. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. And we had this fabulous experience. We had just read about that. Um, and then uh, one morning we were sitting out on our front porch and I had the app mm -hmm. that I was talking about earlier doing bird calls and all of a sudden, the bird that we were in its territory came in to see who was making that call. Um, yeah. So that was pretty cool. And then another incident that very same morning was that um, the birds were all around, you know, how they do singing. And, mm -hmm. and then we heard a hawk. And then all of a sudden, this little chickadee went under a leaf and stood as still as I've ever seen a bird sit for a while and it was just interesting and fun to have read about the bird behavior in the book and then experience them that's so cool it was yeah, really I was, cool i was working uh, i i work with this teen and we were um fishing out at the coast the other day and there was a whole bunch of seagulls not that far seagulls and there, yeah it was all it was mostly all seagulls um not that far away from where we were and um suddenly all the seagulls just took off and um like i'm i'm trained now to always like whenever i see something like mm -hmm. that or like i recognize some of the alarm calls i look up 
and um, there was a peregrine falcon that was just fl flew what? right. Through. It didn't cat. It didn't catch any, but it it flew right through um, where the the those birds had all just been. And I, I've definitely just from learning some uh, some basic kind of like bird body language and alarms seen so many more um raptors and and other predators too you know like you can tell like sometimes like the mockingbirds will make this sound when there's like the neighborhood a neighborhood cat walking around and then you start oh, right. hearing them, and then you look over and you know there's the cat so that's really cool that you used um use that book um let's see here so those are some really cool like resources and everything um i think can wrapping I up share an app real quick yeah 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 definitely um so i naturalist um mm. it does fit in with the citizen scientist because there are different um projects that you can mm -hmm. join but you you can either like take a picture or upload a picture of whatever plant or animal or insect and then um choose the identification of it and then other people within that community will confirm or offer a suggestion for you know what it is instead so yeah. um actually i don't really think i can show on here because it'll <laughs> it'll reflect my screen yeah. but iNaturalist has um like the museum the sorry the natural history museum of la county has mm -hmm. a lot of citizen scientists projects so you could um, upload your pictures of squirrels. They're keeping track yeah. of squirrels and it will contribute to their data or mm -hmm. they have one for toads. Um, so, you know, there's different ones that you can join for your local community. There's yeah. um, projects just for local parks. So you can kind of be able to contribute to, you know, that citizen scientist aspect and also be engaging with the community. Yeah, I love iNaturalist, and I've been um, really curious of how to um, combine, somehow like incorporate iNaturalist, the power of iNaturalist in the community with the nature journaling community. Um, obviously, it's very great for um, photographers and, and, and for, you know, getting kids who are already interested in photography into like the identification of plants and animals. And it's so useful. Like I've um, for identifying things, even before, even with the the machine learning, like before someone, an actual person, um, proposes an identification for your photo of a, a plant or animal, the, the the app itself with the machine learning is often correct, you know. And um, like I haven't used it as much as some people, but you can do really cool things on there. Like when you go to a given park you can look up what people have seen there oh, um, and then try cool. to find them. Like last time I was in San Diego visiting my mom, I really wanted to nature journal um, a horned lizard. And so I went on iNaturalist and I could look at like for a whole regional park um, where people had seen um, that species in that area, when they had seen them and like find it on the map and everything. And it was it's just such it's a such a cool resource and i've just been curious of how like um and i know they do these like bio blitzes they they organize bio blitzes um which i think is something that can be really fun for kids too but i still haven't figured out quite how like like what is a cool way to um combine iNaturalist with nature journaling um but it seems like there's a fruitful intersection there yeah just briefly one of the things that we've done is um incorporating the data from iNaturalist because you can see how many observations there have been of a certain species in your area and you can also look back on your own data to see um, tying into what Della said about the phrenology wheel you can see okay we saw tadpoles for the first time of the year you know in this month and you can kind of look back through your own data to help inform your nature journal and you know kind of add more of that metadata mm -hmm. yeah that's really cool yeah it seems like that's a that would be a good way to um combine them um so i think um for kind of um wrapping up here we've talked a lot about um like real cool specific stuff and things that people can use but what are some just kind of some um you know ways to kind of um like 
going back to kind of really the, the why of um, teaching nature journaling in homeschool and nature study, um, like what are some of the the like main like benefits um, that you've experienced um, from this, and and why would you recommend um, teaching nature journaling and nature study at home? That's a hard one. <laughs> I well, one of the biggest benefits I think is establishing a connection for your children to the natural world, and it also I think um, provides a greater understanding of how everything affects everything else, um, especially later on. You know, when you're looking to do things like more recycling or less plastic, it's there's um, heart, it's heart centered. You know, they have a experience with the natural world, and so that affects them. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Wendy? Um, there's a quote. I, I think it can. It's a really kind of big picture thing for me, like a long term thing. So um, there's a quote that really stuck with me. Um, it's from George Eliot, and it's. The beginning of it is just we could never have loved the world so well had. Wait, wait, hold on. We can never have loved the world so well. Um, if we, I'm gonna have to paraphrase because it's left my mind. Um, if we had not had childhood in it, mm. and I think that that really informs my whole why for doing it is being able to really love, you know, love. The world around us and have that reverence for um, nature and you know Charlotte Mason talks about putting children in sympathy with nature and so I think it it builds this overall um, just feeling of caring about what's going on and I do think observation skills really pay off in any area so it does translate outside of nature journaling and um, there are things that I never would have noticed if I hadn't systematically you know without really trying trained myself to notice more because of nature journaling um, so I think there's a lot of things that kind of pass us by because there's so much in the world and in our lives but being able to really notice what's going on and notice changes and you know look for patterns in life, I feel like those kinds of things translate to any discipline and just make us better people. Mm. Wow, those are both really poignant um, explanations of uh, some of the benefits. And I obviously, um, I mean, I, it's like preaching to the choir because I mean, I can come up with a whole lot for sure. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it seems like there's so many transferable skills as well. And um, my experience has been just in the, I, I, I don't have kids um, and don't homeschool, but I work with kids who are homeschooled um, often for like long periods of time with an individual kid, like over multiple years. Um, and what I've seen is it's so flexible. It's like, okay, it, it's flexible, but it, it provides this through thread. It's like, okay, Get, get your journal out like and you know what what is the thing that you're interested in right now and like oh surfing okay like how can we nature journal about that and then you know like how can we bring in like and then we can bring in physics like you know like I started to look up the physics of how waves break it's actually super fascinating and it applies to all these other things and then it's like oh waves it's like you can just easily just kind of connect all these different things and then you can and then also like with jack's resources john Muir laws it's you know what more could you want he explains like directly like okay you can connect this to language arts you can connect this to math and he has like su such that that curriculum provides so many um you know just like really really helpful um units that you can use um so this is all like super exciting and i think what i um what i want to ask is like um, it seems like, uh, do you have any places where you want people to check you out or if people want to follow more of what you're doing or I know Wendy that you're on Instagram and Della, do you have any place that you, um, you want to share that people can follow you and I can put them in the, um, the comments in the description down below. Um, um yeah, yeah, oh, go, oh, go. 
Oh, there's. Oh, there's... <laughs> yes, yeah, I, have I have a website, a website The Beauty, the of, beauty play. of Play. Okay, let me it's put that into the. Be... Yeah, yeah thebeautyofplay.com. And then I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And is it at the. Uh, uh, are you called The Beauty of Play on there or. Yes, on Instagram, there's an underscore between the words. Okay. And, and it's just all one on Facebook. Okay, cool. Great. And, and what, do you, what do you put on there? Uh, homeschooling information, all kinds of homeschooling information, our journey of what we're doing, little tutorials of the projects Great. we've done. Yeah. Awesome. So people, you can check out um what Della is up to there um and how about you wendy uh, i just want to comment on Della's real quick um, okay I've met oh. Della through instagram and i am just so inspired by you know what she does um she has so many creative resources for math and science and um she just you can really tell how much she loves what she's doing um, and I just, I definitely recommend checking it out. So thank you. Wendy. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to follow you on Instagram. I'm going to follow you Della cause I haven't followed you yet. All right. Uh, <laughs> Wendy, what, what, where are you at? Uh, Instagram accidental stars, all one word. Just accidental stars on Instagram, right? Yeah. Cool. Great. So people can check you out there and on Instagram. And what is your what do you post on there? Uh, it started off as homeschooling, but as my son got older, it's transitioned mostly to my own nature journaling, um, mm -hmm. or lots of like California native plants. Um, cool. But I do post still about homeschooling um, mm -hmm. and mostly like math and science and nature stuff. Yeah, I've seen, I follow, I've been following you already because um, I think we met at the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, right? Yeah. And you always have like, you post like cool photos of like your, your, um, your indoor kind of learning area and everything. And it's always like, I'm always like, ooh, nice. Like it's always really like organized and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, thank you. And the recent, it's all horrible theme, but it's a gorgeous map. The recent oh, yeah. um, air quality maps that you did were gorgeous yeah oh thank you that's for the wildfires like in the west right um cool. yeah so i'd say it's a blend of nature journaling and homeschooling and nature in general great well thank you both so much for coming on here it's been such a pleasure talking to you and i really hope like that some of these um ideas and tips will provide motivation and these this video will be up um, and available um, after the live so people can always um, get back on and um, see it even if they missed the live. Um, and I hope like just getting to hear about some actual homeschool parents who are using nature study will be uh, really motivating and helpful. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for having us. And for everybody who's joined us for the uh, live broadcast, Shannon, Lori, um, I know that Anita was on here earlier. Um, thank you all for joining, and we're going to end the live broadcast now. Bye. Bye.